Have you ever wondered if your death will make it onto the news? Great. An existentialist. I knew this was going to be another dead end for my article. I scanned my eyes over the kid I was interviewing. He was clearly a junkie. The blotches of blood along his white sleeves didn't serve him any favors in disguising that. His pungent odor of weed and urine weren't helping either. I prayed the smell of coffee and eggs would overpower his stench. It was bad enough to get us kicked out of the cafe. And I wanted my food before that happened. How embarrassing. It's not something I frequently stress about. I chimed. He seemed on edge. I wondered if he was high at the time. Probably. I began to question if this was really worth it. After all. I was only writing for the local newspaper and none of our older readers wanted to hear the thoughts of a disadvantaged youth. I pushed past my judgment and remembered there is a ladder to climb in journalism. Sometimes you just have to do the crap once. It would be a good challenge to spin this into something decent. You said you had a story for me. Something that could save lives. I asked. I said I had something to tell you that will save lives he snapped. But I don't want you to publish anything about me. You can't go to the news with this shit. Surely he had to be joking. His serious tone indicated otherwise. He fumbled his hands and threw a nervous glance over his shoulder. He'd been doing that since we sat down. It was like he was expecting someone to stroll through the cafe door. This wasn't going to work for me. Sweetie, you know I can't do that. I pointed to the notebook laid in front of me. It's my job. I'm here to find a story for the paper and your email said you had one. I expected you understood how this would work. Given you arranged this meeting, I tried to sound as nice as possible without letting my frustration sneak in. Clearly it had failed. The kid began to shake his head. He slammed a fist down on the table, clattering the cutlery. I jumped. Sorry. So sorry. He stammered. Please. I just need you to listen to me for five minutes. He raised his brow, begging with bloodshot eyes. I hope nobody else in the cafe had tuned into the desperate turn the conversation had taken. It was time for a quick exit. I'm sorry. I'm on a tight schedule. I said, snapping the notebook shut. I really can't afford to be exchanging campfire stories for fun. I made an attempt to leave but he grabbed my wrist. Please, don't go. His untrimmed nails dug into my skin as he spoke. They would definitely leave a mark. I can give you something of value. Trust me. Listen, I know what really happened to David Flemington. The name stopped me in my tracks. This will all make sense. I swear, he added. I recognized it. Why did I recognize it? The teenager released my wrist and capitalized on the first sign of interest I'd shown all morning. David Flemington, you know. The kid that fell into the cardboard box crusher. It came back to me. Earlier this week some poor boy had managed to get stuck in one of those awful hydraulic compressors at our local supermarket. The ones they use to flatten the boxes that their products arrive in. The story had made international headlines and had raised concerns about the safety of those machines. I'd followed it from a distance. To be honest the whole thing made me feel quite ill. It was a ghastly way to go and not worth visualizing. What about him? I asked, hesitantly intrigued. The day before his death he was told exactly how he would die. I felt my chest constrict with rage. How could he possibly know such a thing? Was he having a laugh? What's your name young man? I spat. Robert. Well Robert. If I were you, I didn't finish. As if sensing my doubts, he had produced a phone with a picture of himself and another boy on the cracked screen. I stared at the two for a moment. I connected the other boy to be David Flemington. He was just how he had appeared in the news stories. From the image alone they looked quite close. You knew him? I asked. Robert slowly nodded as he pocketed the device. If you couldn't tell, I'm a bit of an addict. No kidding. I chuckled. Robert wasn't amused. David and I would shoot up together. He was one of my suppliers dot 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 well. More of a friend. We used to find places we could go and get high without being disturbed. Abandoned warehouses. Industrial estates. Places where the trouble couldn't find us. He paused, nervous with what came next. I failed to see where any of this was going. The readers were not going to like this and it was never getting past an editor. Do you know the Forever House? He asked. I gave a slight nod. The Forever House was an old double-story weatherboard that sat on the fringes of town. Probably the first structure you'd see upon arriving here. It had remained there since the 1960s and nobody lived in it to my knowledge. Every time you drove past the rotting structure you half expected. No hoped that it had been demolished. Yet it still remains standing after all these years. Locals have coined it the Forever House due to its much overstayed welcome. David wanted to go and explore it. He continued. He saw it as a quiet place to go and shoot up. A perfect location for our needs. A smirk flickered over the kid's face. I'm never one to say no to a good time so we arranged a date to meet up at the house. Naturally, I was late. I expected David to be inside upon my arrival but he was waiting for me out the front. That's not how we usually did things. He looked all sweaty and was extremely jittery. That's odd for someone on drugs. Robert clicked his jaw. 
unhappy with the interruption. He clearly was not one for my sarcastic humor. His loss. He chose to let it slide and dive back in. It was different. I asked him what was going on and he told me not to go inside. He became insistent on leaving. I was pissed off. It had been a shit show of a bus journey and now he was telling me we weren't going ahead. Robert looked at me to relate. I reconsidered my career choice in that moment. I really thought my life was about to become listening to stoner arguments that one could easily watch for free in the wonderful metropolis. He leaned in. The subject matter wasn't for the entire cafe to know. He said he'd been inside. Thought that the place was bugged. He had heard someone in the house that knew things about him. Knew his name. A drug dealer hearing voices. I must have rolled my eyes because Robert became even more desperate to maintain my attention. David wasn't bust. He hadn't taken any of the shit yet. We started getting looks from the other customers. But the kid doubled down. Look, I thought the exact same thing. But he claimed to have been cold turkey. I asked for more. Like, you know, specific details and stuff. David wouldn't really get into it but he told me there was definitely something in the living room. It was a... A voice, like a recording. It mentioned his name. Then it started to explain how he would die. What did it say? I suspected the kid was bullshitting and I wanted to see how deep he could dig this hole. It predicted the cardboard crusher. He heard someone, or something, saying he had fallen into the cardboard crusher at the supermarket an entire day before it happened. And what did David make of that? I asked making an over-exaggerated look of shock on my face. Well, he was certain it was some kind of setup. It knew his name and the supermarket he worked at. He thought the cops somehow knew about us. Robert stopped and took in my goofy expression. I had stopped trying. I can see you think this is all bogus. But you need to listen to me. I sighed. This interview was clearly not what he had desired. That made two of us. He scanned me up and down, examining every aspect of my body language before resuming. I didn't know if I believed him at first too. But we decided that evening wasn't going to be a good trip. Emotions were running too high. We bust back home and all David could think about was the fact that the cops might be on his trail. He was agitated for the entire trip. I told him to take it easy for the next 24 hours. Lay low and it'll be fine. Well he did just that dot 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 went to his supermarket job the following afternoon and dot dot dot. Robert started to choke up. I'm sure the cardboard crusher was the next step in his tail. Tears formed and started to fall onto the table. He was really putting on a show. I realized that maybe. Just maybe, he actually believed his own story. I had no clue what this kid was taking or what he'd hallucinated. But I couldn't help feel a little bit sorry for the trauma he'd been through. This narrative was probably just his way to make sense of losing a friend. That is, if Robert actually did know David, I still couldn't be certain of that. I decided to give him the benefit of the doubt. I tapped his hand and offered him my napkin. He managed to blubber out a snotty thank you. This kid clearly didn't need a story published but rather some serious therapy. I tried to comfort him. You know Robert. He straightened up and cut me off. I'm not done yet. This next bit's important. He dried his eyes with the napkin and scrunched it up into a tight ball. After David died I knew something was very wrong at the forever house. Everything he heard in that living room became true. I had to go back and find whatever did this to him. I had to destroy it. I grabbed my notebook and stood up. I really couldn't let him keep talking. I wasn't going to wait for the food. It was time for this to end. I was done with the spooky stories. I'm sorry Robert but I really have to go. It's been lovely chatting with you and I really do wish you all the best. He held up his palm, gesturing me to halt. No, he said firmly. This part concerns you. I went to take a step but Robert slowly placed his hand over a knife. Ever so kindly provided by the cafe. He made sure I saw it. I froze. He inhaled deeply before calmly speaking. You have to sit and listen. This will all be over soon. I did as I was told. After everything he had said this morning there was no telling how unhinged this kid could be. I looked, hoping someone else in the cafe would step in. But they were all too busy in their conversations. I placed my hands on the table, revealing they were empty and in no way hostile. Very good, he smiled. You were saying, well, after a bit of thought. I went back into Forever House yesterday morning. I climbed its broken staircase and went into the living room. You were searching for the thing that killed David? I added. Correct. He seemed pleased I had been engaged with his story. I had to make him feel heard. Anything to keep the teen with the knife happy. There was nobody. Nothing. He began to carefully twirl the knife. Just a couple of musty sofas. Damaged floorboards and an old television set. No source of the mysterious voice. I began to exit the room when the television flickered on. A news report started to play. Some guy on the screen dot 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 the newsreader. Open the show by announcing today's date. I shot him a look of confusion. Yes. As in today's date, Robert clarified. He explained further. The television was showing a news program 24 hours before it existed. 
The newsreader then said my name and I realized this must have been what David heard when he entered the house. I wasn't going to watch the show after knowing what happened to him. I had to end it before I saw anything. Robert started pushing the point of the blade into the table's surface. I ran across the room to turn it off, pull it out of the wall, but the cord wasn't even plugged in. It had no power and yet it was still working. Making it stop it was beyond my capabilities. I placed my hands over my ears. I had to leave before I heard any circumstances surrounding my death. Did you? I asked. Robert swallowed nervously. That's when I caught a glimpse of you. My knee was wobbling under the table now. I crossed both my legs to keep it stable. I was seriously uncomfortable. Usually I'm listening to stories that have nothing to do with me. I attempted to cover my eyes but I saw your name on the screen. He said licking his lips. With all the talking his mouth must have been getting dry. That's how I was able to find your email address last night. You were being interviewed on the news because you'd witnessed my death. The reporter was asking you questions, wanted to know what you had seen. I tried not to listen but I still caught a slither of what you were saying. He took a quick sip from the table water and kept going. Your exact phrasing was being choked. A man came up behind from nowhere. I shook my head and stared at him. This meant nothing to me. He threw his hands back in a surrendering pose. That's it. That was all I heard. I was perplexed. You believe a man is going to choke you to death because you thought you heard me say it on a television? I know you say it. He snarled. David's fate was the cardboard crusher in mine. For whatever reason, is being choked out by some guy. I don't think you get much of a choice in the matter. I shouldn't have entertained this nonsense but I still didn't understand his headspace. Whilst his story was somewhat consistent, it baffled me as to why he'd want to meet with me. If I was supposed to be present during his death wouldn't he want to get as far away from me as possible? I certainly know I would. I tried to voice this concern in a way that wouldn't panic him. Then why do you want me here? That's a reasonable question. I figured once you've heard the television, your fate is pretty much sealed. I could risk trying to get away from you but I reckon no matter how hard I try, somewhere, somehow, you will still end up witnessing my death. Robert finally took his hand off the knife and brought his hands into a pleading gesture, which is why I'm begging you, when I die today, not if when, I need you to stay away from the reporters. Don't speak to them. He pointed towards the door he had been constantly checking. Any minute now a man is going to walk into this cafe and kill me. I can't do anything about that. He swallowed the fear he clearly felt. What I can do is try anything that will stop that news report from happening. The only reason I know I'm going to bite the bullet is because I heard you say it on that damn television. If you don't speak to the media, I never learn that information. If I never learn that information, I might just escape this. He grabbed my arms and leaned in. He had gone full crazy. Promise me. He uttered and looked back at the knife. Or I will have to kill you. Suddenly. The waiter arrived with our breakfast. Robert released his grip and sat back in his chair as the plates were placed on the table. He held eye contact with me as he snatched his fork and scrounged at his eggs for a bite. His mouth slowly chewed as he awaited my answer. So, what do you saw? His face turned red and his expression dropped. Robert's windpipe had become clogged with a piece of egg. He clawed at his neck and thumped his chest in a bid to dislodge the food. His eyes bulged and leaked tears. The guttural noises drew in the attention of the entire cafe. I was too shocked to say anything. I wished I had called out. Our waiter attempted to perform the Heimlich maneuver but to no avail. He dropped him to the floor, flesh smacking the ground. The ambulance arrived impressively fast but it was too late. Robert lay dead on the cafe's tiles. He was just a kid. The authorities arrived soon after. They didn't ask too many questions given the amount of people who had witnessed the horrible event. I know it was a morbid thought, but at least it hadn't played out like Robert had described. Had he been murdered in front of my eyes by some mysterious man I might have actually believed his drug-fueled conspiracy. Whilst there were parallels with the choking I excused it as some freak coincidence. Still, a shame to lose such a creative mind like that. As I exited the cafe, I left behind a morning from hell and as predicted, a very dead end for my article. I noticed a news van and its crew had propped up in the car park, interviewing customers about what had happened. A reporter approached and asked me if I would feel comfortable giving an eyewitness account. I thought back to what Robert had asked me and politely declined. I wanted to leave. I was done with stories for the day. However the news reporter persisted. He asked me about my line of work. I briefly explained my journalistic endeavors to which he responded with a grin. Well, this could be a great opportunity for some networking. I thought about it. There's no harm getting your foot in the door and it's not like I was going to mention anything about the evil man Robert thought would choke him. I'd still be keeping a dead stranger's wish if I left that bit out. I agreed and gave the interview. Afterwards, the reporter thanked me and told me to call up the news station. 
He said if I mentioned his name he could possibly pull a few strings to get me into one of the crews. At least something positive had come from all of this. That evening I settled into my sofa as I awaited my appearance on television. Robert's name was mentioned on the local news program followed by my interview. It really had shaken me up. I wondered how his family was doing dot 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 if he even had one. I listened to my voice as it played through the speakers. It all happened so fast. I was interviewing the boy for the paper when he suddenly stopped speaking. It took me a moment to realize it was from the food dot 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 he was being choked. A man came up behind from nowhere. I think it was our waiter. He started performing the Heimlich maneuver but it didn't work. It was awful. Just awful. My insides flipped as I repeated the sentence I had said in the interview. What was my phrasing? Being choked. A man came up behind from nowhere. I should never have spoken to that news crew.